so good. I love just lingering in his presence, and that's kind of what we're talking about today. Let me ask you something. How would you like to be given the title, the dubious title, the loneliest person in the human race? How would you like that title? That was actually the title given to Al Warden. Does that name ring a bell to anyone? How about the Apollo missions? Does that, does that ring a bell? Al Warden was the commander of Apollo 15. And you all know I grew up in a NASA household. My dad was friends with all these astronauts and stuff. But the guy seated in the middle was the commander. And he was given the dubious title. His actual title was the loneliest human being ever. And it was for a good reason. Because while his dream was to captain this mission, Apollo 15, and he ended up being one of just seven men who was the farthest from humanity. One of seven that could claim that. Farthest in distance, farthest in location, farthest in, in lack of communication. One of the things that was a drawback of being the commander was it didn't allow him to fulfill his dream of stepping foot on the moon. He had to watch his two buddies down on the actual surface of the moon doing what he dreamed. But he was the commander. His job was to fly this ship around the moon. And he would circumnavigate the moon several times. And he would watch his compatriots down there collecting rock samples and doing all whatever it is they do down there, playing golf and stuff. And they're having a great time. And his job was so intense while piloting this that he got three hours of sleep a night. The other 21 hours, he was wide awake and he was doing experiments and he was photographing the surface of the moon and creating detailed maps that we would come to know later and use and all the sea of tranquility and all these great things. And he would have all this stuff. But he said, none of that compared to the best part of his trip. And the best part is ironic because it's probably what would freak us out. You see, several times his ship would go on the dark side of the moon. Okay, you recognize that? It's not a Pink Floyd album. I mean, it is, but that's not the only reason. I know you're thinking it. The dark side of the moon was when his command capsule would be on the far side of the moon, farthest from the earth, meaning the moon would block all communication. And one of the BBC reporters that interviewed him said, I got to ask, when you were cut off from all communication, I mean, all communication, not even Houston could get you, were you scared? And more importantly, were you lonely? And his response was so telling. Three simple words. He said, not at all. In fact, I loved it. You loved being cut off from humanity? Having no, I mean, if something went wrong, you couldn't send for help if you wanted to. I mean, that kind of gives me some kind of space heebie-jeebie claustrophobia thing going on. I can't press my life alert button. I can't do nothing. I can't summon help if I wanted to. And he said, it was awesome. You see, there's a huge difference. You want to know why I wasn't lonely? Because there's an awesome difference between being alone, which I wanted to be, and being lonely. Two huge differences. You see, when I was on the dark side of the moon, for the first time, I could tune out Houston. I could silence them. All that chitter chatter. We need this. Can you give us a report? Nothing. And I wasn't in trouble for it. And all my astronaut buddies couldn't talk to me. And it was awesome. Because you know what I did? I gazed out that window. And I basked in the awe and wonder of creation. True silence. And he sat there and he got to see things we'll never see this side of glory. And he said it was awesome, and I wasn't lonely at all. I could bask in that, and that is the whole point. When we abide with God, what floods us is the privilege of basking in the awe and the wonder and the majesty of the Creator. As I was sharing this story with my family this week, my son Milo piped up. He had a comment, of course. And he said, Dad, you know, I know Papa's a great you know, NASA scientist, and we, we, we've got all these famous <laughs> astronaut friends and stuff. He said, but I want to be an astronaut. And when I grow older... I'm not going to just stop at the moon. I'm going to explore further. I said, is that right, son? He said, yeah, but I'm not, the moon is going to be a distant memory. I'm going to go explore the sun. <laughs> the sun. He said, I know. I know what you're thinking. It's too hot. That's why I'm going to go at night. <laughs> when the sun is off, see? I love that. I love that. Today, like those explorers before us, we're going to explore John chapter 15. You can turn there, but don't read it yet, okay? Context is everything. I want to set the context for what we're doing here. We're going to explore the word abiding. What does it mean to abide? 
So let me set this nighttime scene. We're going to go back 2,000 years. It is about 24 hours left in Jesus' human life, okay? He's with his disciples. He's got his best friends around him, and he's walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane. But to get there, he passes through this ancient vineyard, the ancient vineyard that he refers to many times, where some of the best lessons were taught. And he walks through this vineyard, and he starts talking about the vine dresser. But there's something kind of eerie about the way Jesus is talking. What he starts doing is sharing things that are like, kind of sounds like it's final. You know what I mean? Because it was. By next afternoon, he would be hanging on a cross. So he gathers his disciples around him. He goes, guys, I want to tell you something. I'm going to leave you with something. And you're not going to, but tomorrow is going to rock your whole universe. It's going to be really, really wild what happens. And you're not going to grasp it all. And he's trying to pour himself. You can almost hear just a tinge of, of sadness and the weight and the gravity of the moment coming on him. And he leans in and goes, guys, listen closely to me. I am pleading with you, no matter what happens tomorrow, do not give up. Don't abandon your faith. When the times get tough, when things can look really dark, hang in there. You need to stay connected to me. You need to abide with me. And he starts talking about this beautiful thing. In fact, he uses one word, not once or twice or a couple times, not five or six times. He uses one specific word, 10 times. Now, if Jesus were to walk in and say, Matt, I need you to do blank, and he would say something, I'd probably pay attention. But if he said it again, I'd be like, okay, that's important. If he said it again and again and again and again and again and again, 10 times, do you think it might be important? Especially knowing it was his last night with you? That word was abide. He says abide. Your Bible may say remain. He uses it no less than 10 times in like a few sentences. And it's important. With that in mind, Let's read what he says next, starting in verse 3 there. You are already clean because the word of which I had spoken to you. Abide, there it is, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them up and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask for what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you would bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. It's one of my all-time favorite passages. It is so deep. It is so full of great truths and hidden stuff. A beautiful church member here bought me this the vine, and it has this actual verse on it. And I won't embarrass the, the sweet lady who bought this. Her initials are Louise Dodona, and this is, <laughs> this is what we're talking about here. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. I love this. This is hanging on my wall in my office. It's one of my favorite passages. Today, we look at this scripture, and we get a mental picture of vineyards, but we're so unfamiliar with vineyards. So what I did is I went across the street. I came up here last night, and I noticed this branch was hanging off the tree. And so I picked it off, and I was up here last night, and I came in here, and I was praying for you. And I prayed over every single chair and what God would speak to you today. And it was a sweet time. And I looked at this, and it it dawned on me, this is what Jesus was saying. He's saying, guys, don't be deceived by this. There might be a little bit of green left in it, because you were once connected, but this is no good to anyone. This branch will soon be dead because it's broken off. It has no source of nourishment. He's saying, don't be like this. A dead branch is a disconnected branch, and it does no one no good. The leaves are no longer going to bloom. There's no more seeds that can go. It can't spread any of its pollen or whatever to anything else. It is literally dying. And Jesus is saying, guys, you need to remain in me or you're going to look like one of these branches. This is, this is what he is trying to get people's attention. In fact, he uses the Greek word may know. If you're not familiar with the word, the word simply means remain steadfastly connected to Jesus. And that's what he's saying in here. You, you must may know with me. You must remain in me or you will die. You will decay like this branch. And it will be a, a sad thing. And we know what it says. These branches will be thrown into the fire. Before his crucifixion, Jesus was so urgent. And I could just gather him. I could just picture this in his mind. He's saying, stay connected, produce fruit, don't fade, don't give out on me, because here's the deal. When I'm gone, it's going to be your job now 
to represent me on earth. Can you imagine what the disciples thought? It's sobering. It's kind of like that mantle has passed to us. The disciples are gone now. Now guess whose job it is? It's your job and mine. We're the ones carrying this mantle, saying, stay with the Lord. He is the one. In vineyard terms, abiding happens when the branch connects to the vine. In spiritual terms, our connection to Jesus is what gives us God's power. It's what gives us that, that presence and allows us to bear fruit for him. God gives us amazing grace to know his son, to be grafted into his family. And we are grafted in, and that is secure. Hear me. That relationship is secure if you have made that transaction. We, what we do is we mess up the words fellowship and relationship. And they're two different things. When we read scripture here, we see that Romans says there is no one who seeks after God on his own. That's relationship. God seeks us. It is all dependent on God. He comes. There's no one righteous. None of us wake up and go, I think I'm going to seek God. God draws us. God woos us. And it is dependent on him. Our relationship is our standing with him. How are you with that? Once that's secure, then you move to fellowship. And this is totally different. And this is what Jesus was getting at. He's saying, your fellowship can be affected by you. Your relationship, that depends on God. Your fellowship, however, can be affected by the willingness you live in your life to please him. For instance, if you are living in an unrepentant, habitual sin, and you know it, and the Spirit has convicted you, your fellowship will be affected. Not necessarily your relationship, but your fellowship. If you're living in unrepentant, intentional, blatant sin, your fellowship will be damaged. Let me show you what this means in modern day terms. Let's just say hypothetically, there's a strapping young lad from Titusville, Florida that played soccer, okay? I'm just gonna guess this guy's name is Matt and he's gonna grow up to be a pastor one day. Let's just say hypothetically that Matt's father strongly, strongly urged him, do not kick the soccer ball in the backyard. Now let's just say hypothetically that Matt disobeyed. Okay, just I'm not going to confirm or deny this. And Matt was kicking the ball with his brother. It's probably the brother's fault, but something happened right after this. And it looked like that. Now, I knew my father's will. I knew my dad's instruction. And while it probably wasn't me that kicked this ball, I was part of this experience. What happened next? Did my dad come rushing out of the house with my suitcases packed and throw them at me at seven years old and say, that's it, I break with thee, I break with thee, I disown thee, you're gone. Would that be a little extreme? I think so. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. Neither does God do that when we commit a sin. But do you think our fellowship was slightly damaged until I went to him and made things right, until I went to him and repented and said, Dad, you were right, I agree with you on this, you said not to do it, and I did it, and I'm sorry, until I make things right, you bet it affected our fellowship. There was a strain on it. If I look up in the sky, and we see the sun, and a giant dark cloud comes between me and the sun, I might notice it being darker, but is the sun still there? Absolutely. The sun hadn't gone anywhere. Physics haven't changed. Sun's still there. I'm still here. I might not feel the heat and the warmth from it, but it hasn't changed. It's still there. I'm still, just a cloud of sin may have separated me from feeling the warmth of the Father. Does that make sense? In other words, that old saying that you hear is so true. If God feels far away from you, guess who moved? It, it wasn't God. It wasn't the sun. The sun didn't, that's it, I'm, I'm done shining. It wasn't that. Our sins separate that. So Jesus comes along in John 15, and he's using an imperative command. This is a rare thing. Jesus is not saying, I hope you do this. I want you to do this. It's a command. It's an imperative. You are to abide. You know what that tells us? If you're really serious about your faith, this says it takes intentional action on our part to abide. Abiding deeply with Jesus never happens by accident. Okay? That's a good one. That's not even a note, but you should write that down. It never happens by accident. You don't just stumble, oh, I just fell into a great loving relationship with the Lord. I feel so close. It takes intentionality. And Jesus is telling his key disciples, who he'd poured his life into for three years, saying, guys, you need to 
abide in me. Don't get separated. The enemy is going to come in like a flood and try to get you distracted and try to get you severed from the vine and try to distract you from these things. But here's the mind-blowing truth. The God of the universe, for some reason, wants us to abide more deeply with him. He's inviting us to come and abide more deeply with him. This is astounding. Why? I don't know, but I'll take it. And we can talk to him later and we can ask him this. Do you want to have a deeper relationship? Do you want to go deeper with him and bear great fruit for the kingdom? God is inviting you to abide more deeply with him. More deeply today than you were yesterday. Every day growing deeper. And when you do, you will start to learn his secret desires for you and what he wants out of your life. And you'll start to see truths pop out at you, like the one found just a few verses later in John 15, 15, where he says this, now I no longer call you servants because servants don't know what their master's doing. But now I call you friends. What? Because I've told you everything my father has told me. Let's be honest. That middle word there in red, friends, is disconcerting to some of us. When we sing that song, I'm a friend of God, it's kind of awkward because we're comfortable with the concept of God loves us. Does God love you? Oh, yeah, God is love. God loves you. God loves you. God loves me. But does God like you? Would he seek you out in human form? Would he call you friend? See, this is what he's telling the disciples, and it's blowing their mind. It's probably freaking them out. Because back in those days, servants served their masters, and then they disappeared. They were not invited into the inner sanctum. They weren't invited to the kitchen table discussions. They didn't get to know the family's dreams and goals and get to hear that. They waited for that door to close and like, okay, they're gone. Now let's have the real talk. Jesus comes, gets all hibbity-flibbity, changes it upside down and says, no, 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 no. Now you're not servants. You're my friends. And he comes and he says, even in the Gospel of Matthew, he reveals these things. Mysteries of the kingdom were revealed to the disciples. Why? Because they abided with them. Hidden truths, things that were hidden from the foundation of the world were opened in their eyes. They got to see some great things. Why? Because they were willing to abide with the master and learn hidden secrets, exclusive knowledge that we get to benefit from. He didn't drop this knowledge on everybody. There was exclusive, beautiful things that they were privy to. So if abiding was important to Jesus and it was important to the disciples, it should also be important to us. If we're the next generation of disciples, and it depends on us to carry the mantle. Here's three reasons why it's so important. The first one, abiding is one of God's greatest desires. One of his greatest desires. Think about this. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, all the way clear through the end of Revelation, the Bible is a catalog, a chronicle of his pursuit of humankind, of him coming and saying, I want to have a personal relationship with the human race even to the point of sending his son to restore this. Revelation 3.20 says this, Look, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. Now listen, don't miss this next part. He says, and we will share a meal together as friends. Man, that's incredible. We're so uncomfortable with that. This is not a buddy from out of town. This is the creator. This isn't someone that tagged up on Facebook, hey, I haven't seen you in 30 years. Want to meet at Burger King and have an awkward conversation? This isn't like that. This is... God, this is the creator saying, I will sup with you. I will let you, it's one of his greatest desires. And he shows this over and over in his word. The second one I found, abiding is our created purpose. That's what it's all about. Probably my second favorite verse in all of scripture is one that somebody bought me and I hung it on my wall. It's one of my all time favorite verses. I don't know if you can read it, but it's Psalm 42. I don't even have to read it. I got it for you. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so longs my soul for you, O God. A deer who's thirsty, who's out in the woods and hasn't found the stream and finally does. When do I get to go and appear before my Lord? David is writing this incredible, heartfelt passage saying, my soul thirsts for you. I am empty. I am incomplete unless I am in communion with you. Are we that hungry? If you had to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10 today, what would you rate your hunger to abide with God? Would it be a 2? Don't answer out loud. Don't answer for your spouse. Don't elbow them. Would it be a 5? 7? 9? What would you do? Because that is our created purpose. Apart from God, our souls remain empty. Are you struggling with purpose? Are you struggling with emptiness? You're probably not 
abiding. Which brings us to the third one. Abiding pleases God and it helps us bear fruit. This is beautiful. We can't do much on our own, just like that branch is slowly dying. It looks worse this morning than it did last night. And I just pulled it off that tree last night. Colossians 1 says this, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. That's what we want to do, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Abiding gives us all this. All right, so now we see the importance of abiding. How does abiding lead to bearing fruit for the kingdom? I want to know that. What, what is that? And the answer leads us to our first truth grenade today. This is so deep. The secret to abiding is not doing more for God, but rather it's being more with God. Whoa, what are you talking about? That sounds almost like a paradox there. We see this exact purpose illustrated in Luke chapter 10. Jesus walks into town and he visits two people, Mary and Martha. And you probably know the story. If not, here's what it says in verse 38. Jesus and his disciples were on their way and they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made, and she came to him and said, Lord, don't you care? My sister's left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to help me. Now, I love what Jesus says back. Martha, Martha, Martha. Have you ever watched Brady Bunch? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. This is what I picture. Martha, 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 the Lord said. You are so worried and upset about so many things. But really, only a few things are needed. In fact, only one. And guess what? Mary has chosen it. She's sitting at my feet and she's learning. I'm not going to take that away from her. That's what he says. So here's the spiritual paradox for me. As we take more time to devote to abiding with God, won't we obviously have less time to do things for him? Well, how does that work? This is why abiding is not for the spiritually immature. Because abiding actually takes a step of faith on your part. Here's what I mean. You must believe that in order for us to do less, in order for you to do less for God so that you can abide more, that God will supernaturally show up and will equip you and bless you and increase your harvest with less time. That is so deep. Let me try to phrase it in a different way. When you Say, God, I am going to spend more time with you so that I can accomplish more. I live this every Monday. When I come in and there's 65 emails waiting and there's five voicemails and 37 texts and I haven't even started on the sermon prep and there's three people in the hospital and there's a funeral and there's all kinds of things going and somebody wants wedding counseling. And so I'm like, oh, I got to get on my day. I got to go. Bye, honey. Uh, it's 8.01. It's time to go. No, no, no. Every time I do that, my day is horrible because I put God back. I don't seek him first, but when I do and I say, no, this first hour is for you and for you alone, Lord, I'm shutting the door, I'm silencing my phone, I'm not returning anything, I'm just going to kneel at his feet. Do you know what my day does? He supernaturally, here's the paradox, he supernaturally invades time and space and I get everything accomplished that day. That if I looked at paper, there should have been no way. And it goes back to that beautiful quote I shared in my very first sermon when we did God Quest. I have so much to do today, I might have to stay in prayer until noon to get it all done. That's so foreign to us. What are we taught? Go get a man. Early bird gets the worm. You need to do it. You got to go. You got to go, man. You got to grab the world. And Jesus comes along and says, enough. Stop it. You're so distracted. Would you sit at my feet? I will smooth out that road. I will fill in those potholes that you don't even know are coming today. I see them. If you will linger in my presence, this is why abiding is not for the faint of heart. It is not for the spiritually wimpy. If you're happy with an anemic faith, you can go ahead and tune out right now. This is so deep. This is why Jesus shared it with his core the night of his death. And he says these things. All right, so Pastor Matt, I I get it. The need for abiding is real. I see the purpose for it. Hit me with the bottom line. What are the benefits? What are the fruit that I will see from this? If I take this challenge and I abide more with God and I carve out time and I protect it and I lock it out and this is it, what can I expect? Here's the good news. Have you ever needed direction from God? Have you ever needed an answer from him? This is where it's found. 
Abiding helps us sense the leading of the Lord. That is the first and most awesome fruit of being with the Lord. You ever need to know an answer? This happened to me. Over these last four weeks, I've had so many weighty decisions. And when I finally was able to stop the noise and focus and hear from the Lord, I got his answer. And I can't wait to share with you some of these things that are coming down the pike. Just keep coming. I'll drop them out. But I got a meeting with my leadership team this Wednesday first, and I want to share some of these things. But it only came when I got with the Lord and was able to hear his leading. Listen to this beautiful passage from 1 Kings. This is about Elijah. The Lord said, Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there came a huge earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there came a raging fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And that's where Elijah found the Lord. That's where he heard his voice. Abiding helps us accomplish more for him because we are more in tune with him and his directives. The second benefit that we see, abiding helps us tap into God's spiritual riches. Woo! Put your shoes on. Here we go. We can draw deeply of God's resources, his love. You need more love in your life? Abide in his presence. Need more wisdom? How about passion? How about energy? How about patience? You ever find yourself impatient with a lot of people? I'm just going to say it. You probably weren't abiding. You ever find yourself needing more joy? You're probably not abiding. You ever find yourself depressed, out of sorts, at wit's end, kind of aggravated with people, lacking stamina? My guess is you probably didn't linger in the Lord's presence long enough to let him take that. Not all the time, but I can guess. When you need more, more resources, they're found there grafted into the vine. They're not in our own flesh. And that's what we have to remind ourselves. Stop doing these things in our own power. Acts 4.13 was talking about boldness. It says, now when the crowd saw the boldness of Peter and John, and yet they perceived these are uneducated, untrained, they didn't go to seminary men, how could they know these things? It says they marveled. And then it hit them. Then they realized, oh, these men have been with Jesus. Oh, to be known as people. When we walk into a room, we're identified, you've been with Jesus. Wow, what a testimony. They were uneducated, unlearned. They didn't go to seminary. They didn't have any of this stuff. And they went, oh, <laughs> I get it. I get it now. now. You've been with the Lord. When you come out of that abiding time, that spending that time with your Lord and devotions and your quiet time, you come out, man, you're dripping with the Holy Spirit. It shows and it rubs off on people. You don't lack patience and you don't lack boldness and you don't lack power and, and generosity and joy. The next fruit we see here, abiding gives us the rest we need to carry on. Woo, anybody tired? Yeah, we're probably not abiding as much as we need to be. When we spend intimate time with God, we are strengthened. We are refreshed to do his work. When we're abiding, we're not stressing. Let me say it again. When we're abiding, we're not stressing. We're not freaking out. We are centered on him. And the last one, abiding often leads to answered prayer. Well, pastor, why didn't you lead with that? <laughs> Isn't that the one we all want? No, I put it last for a reason, because I want us to not mistake this, that this is a genie lamp that you rub. I'm going to spend seven minutes with the Lord, and I want my answer. This isn't that way, okay? This is not about getting God to do something we want. This is totally reversed. This is a way to get in touch with what God wants. This is the Henry Blackaby style model where we find where God's already working and we join him in his work. We don't say, hey, God, over here. That's fine over there, but this is really more important, Lord. It's not about us telling God what he needs to do. Think about it this way. Nothing pleases your parents more than when you come and you ask them for something they already want to give you. Nothing pleases God more than when we come in prayer and we ask God for what he is already wanting to give us, what he's already wanting to do. And when we spend time with him, his purposes become our purposes. Whew, that's deep. How you doing with that? When we spend time with him, his passion becomes our passion. 
his priorities become ours. And we start asking for things in our prayer time that are closest to his heart. Cool. This is so stinking deep. We start asking for things that he's already wanted to give. And he's like, oh, I just was waiting for that. Yes. A thousand times. Yes. Yes. Now you're on the right path. Let me bless you with this. This is so amazing. Every morning when we wake up, the God of the universe wants to commune with us. It's the longing of his heart. And we know his heart never changes. It's still true. He wants to pour his direction into you. You have to abide to receive that. This life-changing friendship with God is at our disposal. We just have to act on it. Jesus is using this whole thing of a vine dresser in this point. And you can put this out in a, in a, in a, in a mental human picture if it helps you. I see the vine dresser walking through and the sun is setting and he's leaning in and he's inspecting your branches. And as he looks and he sees, now he's smiling from ear to ear because he sees your branch is full of huge, ripe clusters of grapes. And he's got such a, a face of joy and satisfaction. And he's enjoying this moment. It's the favorite part of his day because he leans in and he sees how crowded your branches are. And it is what he has had in mind for you since the day your shoot first sprouted. And he smiles because you are accomplishing the purpose he made you for. You're bearing fruit for him. You're abiding. 20 years ago, there was a movie that came out. And it, was, it ended up being a huge hit. It was actually one of my favorite movies. And here's a scene from it. Does anybody recognize what movie this came from? When you look, it's a drive-in theater. Oh, Twister. Anybody see that movie? There's, there's a scene in there where the calm before the storm, they're at this drive-in, and there is a big warning coming of the mother of all tornadoes coming. And in this next shot, you see... You see, well, you might want to dim the lights, Ryan. I don't know if you can see this. But here's Bill Paxson. Here's Helen Hunt. And they're walking around the corner, and they see the big movie screen, and they pause because something's not quite right. And you can see just a little bit of fear in their eyes. There's this one scene where the camera zooms in, and I forget who makes the line. I forget where it happens. But they say something along the lines of, oh, no, it's coming. And the other one says, oh, no, it's already here. And in the very next scene, it shows the movie screen, and you see this panic, and you can almost make out the tornado. The F5 tornado is there. It is on them. It's right behind that screen, and it's starting to destroy the actual movie screen. And they run, and they panic, and they zoom in, and their eyes are wide with fear, and rightfully so. Now go back 50 more years. You can bring my pulpit back up. When we go back 50 more years, John Steinbeck wrote an incredible book called The Grapes of Wrath. And in that scene... There is an Oklahoma family who is out in the fields, and they turn around, and they see this coming. It is a massive dust storm, the mother of all dust storms coming to annihilate them. And all generations, the youngest, the middle generation, and the oldest generation are on this property. And they come running to the front porch. Hearts are pounded. Sweat is pouring down their faces. And the young kids are holding on to mom's and dad's legs. And they're staring out. And you see the young ones that just came in from the field, the strong, the 20s and the 30s. And they're looking and they're, and they're reading this. And they're all trying to calculate how much time they have. And if this is, in fact, even survivable. But those who really want to know what's about to happen are not looking at the storm, their faces turn completely the opposite direction. You have to look for it. But those who really want to know what's about to happen are gazing into the face of the Father. They look at him. Why? Because everything they need to know is written right here. If the Father looks scared, then they should be scared. But if they look and they don't see panic, but they see peace, they have peace. Everything they need to know is written in the face of their Father. When the storms come our way, have you gazed in your Father's face long enough to know that that's where the peace is? When is the last time we stopped and we gazed into our Father's face? Because all we need to know is written right there. When we gaze and we stop and we say, stop being Martha and Mary and all these panicky people and say, Lord, you know what? You've got this. I'm going to kneel at your feet and I'm going to just listen and I'm going to linger in your presence. That's your challenge this week. This week, I want you to do less and abide more. Do less and abide more, okay? Linger longer in his presence a little bit more every day. Whether that's a few minutes, a few minutes more, that's between you and the Lord. He's calling us to his table. Now my question is, what are you going to do? Are you going to accept the invite? Are you going to obey that? 
That's where the power is found. I'm going to have my instrumentalist come up, and as we talk about this, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand in just a second, and we're going to be singing a song. It's going to be a song of worship, and I like to close us out with a final time together. The altar will be open. You can come and pray. No one will bother you. If you want to pray with me, you can come grab me. I'll be right here on the front row. If you want to talk about joining the church or being baptized, or maybe you don't even get any of this, you want to talk about what it means to follow Christ, I would love to talk to you about it. I'll stay as long as you want. We don't have to cram it into just one song. Just come find me after church. Whatever it is that God is leading you to do, just be obedient. That's all. Pray with me. God, I pray that you would open our hearts. Help us to abide with you, to kneel at your feet, to throw the cares of the world at your feet because you care for us. Meet with us now during this time, for you are here. In Jesus' name, amen.